first guest on the program is Juliet A. Terry of J. Terry Consulting. She joins us via telephone. Julie, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am not on the injured reserve or whatever we're calling <laughs> no, it. You're not, load, you're not load managing today like they do in the no. NBA. You're here. We are on, I think today is day 23, if I'm counting correctly, of yes. 60. And we do not get a rest day. <laughs> nice. No, you don't. You get, it's a 60-day sprint. And it if, is. if you don't get it all done, you go back for another week of sprinting for a special session there to finish the budget. But uh, I think they've been doing pretty good about getting the budget uh, done on time the last five, six years. So that works. Well, it's, yes, it's, they it's, have. And, you know, there are those who will criticize regardless of what um, this leadership team does. Um, but as someone who's been around a, a few years now, <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen a different majority, and then I've seen this majority, and um, it's it's kind of great, frankly, mm -hmm. to end the session with some certainty. Uh, we've always ended up having to do supplemental budget appropriations and things like that. So getting the budget done on time, saving the taxpayers the money of a, of an extended full week of budget session, I think is is a great return on their investment with these elected officials. When you have, I mean, when you have a budget surplus and a super majority, they should be able to get it done during the uh, during the time frame. Now, don't confuse super majority with agreement. No. <laughs> yes, no, 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 because it's not. It's not. It's just more of them. <laughs> Let's talk about Senate Bill Fifty Nine. Yes. And how it helps uh, workforce combat fraud and abuse, and what it means for the average person here in West Virginia and what the Opportunity Solutions Project has to do with that, Julie? Well, that's my client on this project. It's a national advocacy organization, and I, I boil it down to let's remember what the American dream is, um, and that is uh, a person being able to, to work, provide for their family, live their lives, invest in their community, um, and that's, that's the goal. Um, I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt who said a good job so it solves a lot of your social problems. Um, so we just let's let's see what we can do with the various government systems out there to help encourage and return the power of work. You know, America works when Americans are working. Um, so unemployment is is an interesting one. Most people, not I won't say most people. Some people don't realize it is not a general taxpayer obligation. Um, it is funded entirely by the employer community, the people who create jobs, the people who sign the paychecks. And you're only in, um, eligible for unemployment if you're working in a job where you're paid legally. Uh, so, or if, for me, I'm a sole proprietor. I'm not eligible for unemployment. You have to be working a wage where, where everything's being withheld properly um, according to all the rules and regulations. Uh, so if you are working on the side, working paid under the table or whatever, you're, you're not going to be eligible. So once we get through all of that kind of um, broad strokes, our system has not really changed much in West Virginia since, I think, the Reagan administration. So it's been 40-plus years of this flat half-of-a-year benefit term, 26 weeks. Um, but our economy is a lot different today than it was back in the early 80s, obviously. Uh, so with OSP, with a lot of legislators who, who looked at unemployment as one of those last untouched government programs that really is, is in need of a modernization, um, we worked really hard with the folks that work for Workforce West Virginia, and that's who manages our unemployment system, mm -hmm. and come up with a package um, you know, with a lot of leadership from President Blair on this. I'll have to give him all that credit um, to not just modernize the benefit term, but do it in such a way that we can then afford to provide a much better service to the people who are temporarily displaced from their full-time job through no fault of their own. And if you quit, you're not eligible for unemployment. Um, but for people who are temporarily displaced, this, this system is supposed to be that bridge between full-time suitable employment opportunities. And um, we think this package gets the job done, but let me pause there before I ramble on too long. Okay, let's start first with how the system is projected to set up if SB 59 passes, and this bases full employment in the state at five and a half percent. And at that point, if you are laid off, so to speak, you would collect up to 12 weeks of unemployment, correct? That's the way uh, 59 is written. Uh, that is based on what we call a, like a Florida model. Um, way back in the mid-2000s after that market crash, um, states like Florida, Georgia, North Carolina saw their unemployment trust funds billions in the red. And they had to come up with a, a better way of managing their benefits term um, so that their trust funds were more stable long-term, employer taxes were, were more predictable, and people got to work faster. That's the whole goal. We want you to get you back into work faster. So um, it's a sliding scale of a benefit term. Uh, economists consider 5.5% to be full employment, which means you have a robust job market. 
Um, in West Virginia, we're, we're slightly under four, maybe right about four right now. We have 55,000 available jobs in West Virginia for about the 13 to 16,000 people who are on unemployment right now. Um, so if, if things change and under 59, it sets up a tier system. For every half a percentage point increase in the statewide unemployment rate, you would add a week, up to a maximum of 20 weeks. So if you look at your maximum, you're just going from 26 to 20. Um, but frankly, the state doesn't need that much time. Okay. And when we look at the current system, you say it's 26 weeks the way it's currently set up? It is. It's a flat, automatic uh, 26 weeks for everybody who, who files. Okay. Uh, now, as, as we move along through this and, and how this is going to work, uh, when we look at the average person in West Virginia who's on unemployment, mm -hmm. the, the average weeks of unemployment claimed statewide in 2022 was eight? That's correct. Okay, and the average for each county in 21 and 22 is less than 12. This is during pandemic times. Even, yeah, even as we were just coming out of the pandemic in 2021 and then through a full year, 22, um, post-pandemic, if we want to call it that, um, you didn't have any, any county with an average uh, greater than 12 weeks claimed. Okay. And, and this is straight from Workforce West Virginia data. There's no, I'm not doing any math, I promise you. I, gotcha. I promised people I would not do math. Uh, this is completely right off of their claims database. Julia Terry is our guest from Opportunity Solutions Project. We're talking about SB 59, which is going to revamp the unemployment system uh, in West Virginia. It's based on uh, four reforms. One, modernize unemployment benefits. Two, keep protecting the system from waste and abuse. Connect unemployed people with jobs and make work search work. Can you take us through these four bullet points, Julie, before we ask any questions about them? Yeah, I'm going to add one more, which is, again, President Blair's uh, brainchild, and that is we're going to finally, if we can pass Senate Bill 59 in a form that, that resembles what it looks like today, we're going to be the first state in the nation to remove which is essentially a penalty on people who, who are displaced from their full-time work but choose to remain productive and remain in the workforce part-time. Right now, if you, if you are honest and you report your part-time income, your, work, your unemployment benefits get reduced. That's a penalty against work. It doesn't make any sense. The only way to pay for removing that penalty is to bring the benefit term down. So that's the fifth prong really underpinning all of this uh, because it's really critical to get people to continue to accept work, accept those opportunities for work, but keep it part-time so they have the opportunity then to search for their new suitable full-time job. Um, let's circle back up to um, fraud and abuse. This is a constantly moving target. Last year the legislature um, rightly passed a bill that gave Workforce West Virginia subpoena power. This gives them the ability to add some teeth to their investigations. But, you know, say you have 100 claims that come through in one day, all from the same IP address. And that can happen now, but they just, out of a good practice, might look into that. Now they would be required to investigate that. It could be that you've got a whole bunch of people at a public library using the same computer terminal. That's perfectly fine. But if it's a foreign IP address and it's somewhere, you know, in another part of the world, probably a good indication that they need to take a hard look at those claims. There's a lot of issues like that, or, or if you've got multiple claims all being routed through the same bank account. Um, issues like that, that they're going to continue to evolve. Fraudsters always find new ways to cheat a system, so I think it's going to be a constantly moving target. Uh, work search activities, that's another big one. Right now, the state law is very vague. It just says a person has to do a reasonable amount of work to find a new job. It's really not more specific than that. Under rule, workforce is required two work search activities per week. But if you log into the system, if, if you're collecting unemployment, all you have to do is click a box and say, yes, I've searched twice. Under 59, we've got a very prescribed list of appropriate work search act activities that workforce believes gives that claimant a much better chance of one of the searches leading to a new job. So those become stepped up. Everything in 59 is designed to get that worker back to work faster. It's going to allow workforce to work with those claimants a lot more individually and pair them with suitable jobs when possible, reduce fraud, and again, let's reward work instead of penalizing it. I want to bring up a couple of things that happened I've seen while I've been here working at WRNR. Uh, one would be people filing claims saying that they worked here and they never did. That's clearly mm -hmm. that's clearly fraud. And during the pandemic, I'm told those claims were getting approved, basically rubber stamped, uh, because we wanted to get money into people's hands. And therefore, people who never worked here who claimed that they were fired from here were then 
filing for and getting unemployment, as I understand it. Uh, two, uh, the other aspect of that is uh, when we would post a job opening, people who are not qualified to work in the positions that we were advertising for were filing for the jobs, therefore checking the box saying, yeah, I applied for work, but they didn't hire me, uh, when clearly they weren't qualified for the qualifications we posted that we needed. Is there anything in this that takes care of those two circumstances? Yes. Um, in the section of the bill that deals with work search requirements in particular, uh, workforce, they're already required by the U.S. Department of Labor to kind of softly audit work search activities. But since the, the claimant isn't putting in a lot of detail, there's, it's pretty hard to audit that. Now that the 59 will require for much more specific work search activity um, you know, applications, job fairs, things that are verifiable, um, work, the workforce then will be required to do a much more deep dive auditing every week, um, you know, a snapshot of, of claimants. It also allows employers to start um, using, there's an existing hotline for fraud that employers can call. This steps that up and gives employers the opportunity to let workforce know that, hey, this person filled out an application and I, I scheduled them for an interview and they didn't show. Now, that wouldn't necessarily cut off their unemployment benefits, but it would give workforce the teeth to go back out to that person and say, you know, we're pausing things until you can explain to us why you missed that interview or why you declined that job that was offered to you that, that according to U.S. Department of Labor rules, is suitable for you. And that's all. suitability is, is a big thing, and we are not touching that at all. And the other thing we're not touching in, in terms of work search, if you're enrolled in a union hall, you've always been exempt from work search activities, and we are not changing that. Very good. John Bodwell. Okay, this uh, this is great. I just I read through all your stuff. I, I think this really helps to revamp and puts us cutting edge ahead of everybody, like you said. Will this bill add any money to add more employees for workforce so there are more people who can look into stuff? Um, I, that's a great question. I don't know that I'm, I'm qualified to answer that. That's probably a workforce question. I can tell you that last year when they did a fiscal note, because we, we had very similar legislation last year, um, and the fiscal notes were minimal. It was really not even for extra staff people, just a little extra staff time um, on recalculating the unemployment rate periodically. In my conversations with the folks at Workforce, they are able to do all of this. And like I said, they've really had a good hand in crafting um, the legislation so that we are considering things they actually can accomplish. We're not trying to give them an unfunded mandate at all. Um, I think they, they want to be empowered to do what in their expertise needs to be done to get people back into a job faster. Well, and to piggyback a little bit on what Rob said, I'm, I own an insurance agency and I've been in business for, you know, 20 plus years here and I get calls and I used to get resumes just mailed to me indiscriminately for people who had no qualifications whatsoever, but I'm sure they were just going back and, you know, telling workforce, Hey, we sent a resume to this place. We sent a resume to that place. Uh, slowing all of that down would, uh, would definitely be uh, be worthwhile. Now you said it's going to go right now. It's it's just you sign up. You've got twenty six weeks. It would go down to thirteen weeks. And did you say there are how many how many open jobs are there in West Virginia? You said there are roughly thirteen thousand people on unemployment. Between thirteen and sixteen. Now I think we're, you know we're in the winter months, so it does tick up a little bit in the okay. in the in the colder months. Um, what workforce has been telling people and telling legislators as they speak to them about a variety of issues um, is that, you know, by and large, you can, it's an easy number to pick, 55,000 available jobs in West Virginia. I've actually asked them, I said, if we put everybody um, on the various welfare programs who is able-bodied, no dependents, no impediments to work, plus everybody um, on unemployment, are there enough jobs for all of those people to go to work tomorrow? And emphatically, the answer was yes. So I mean, basically, and then the yeah. With follow up to that is, does that change our workforce participation rate to the positive? And absolutely, it does. Okay. Well, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, with that amount of jobs and that amount of people who need jobs, you know, workforce can just, you know, say, all right, these are the four choices for you. Which one do you want? And it's <laughs> got to be suitable. They're not going to force someone to take a job that, you know, if they had, weren't already driving fifty miles a day to their work, a, a job that might be, you know, skill set perfect for that person, but it's 50 miles away or a midnight shift where that person's previous job wasn't like that, that's not considered suitable. We're not going to force someone into a job. But if someone decides, I'm going to make a career change, 
absolutely, open arms. Go ahead and take that new job if that's something that you want to do. But, but no claimant's going to be forced to take a new full-time job that isn't considered suitable under the law. Okay. So suitability includes travel time to the job, yes. time of shift, shift, stuff like that. That's good. I did absolutely. not know that. It's not just – so when you are in there, – there's a weak lag in between when you file for unemployment and when you first start to get benefits because they're verifying your eligibility for it. And that's not, not just saying, have you collected a wage up to a certain amount you know, for the last 18 months, all of those things, but it's also then getting that background information on the claimant. These folks at Workforce are trying to pair people with a good, suitable, full-time job, so they want to get to know him. And at 26 weeks – it's hard to keep that level of, of activity up for the entire 26 weeks. By and large, like I said, the statewide average return to work right now is eight weeks. Um, That's but great. there are those, you know, in any system, there are going to be those who are just going to wait until they have to go back to work before they actually start looking. This hopefully will, will shorten that time and get people to remain in the habit of being productive. Julie, is your interest in this based on the Senate wanting to write a bill and then getting information from Workforce West Virginia as to how to craft it? Or was there a problem Workforce West Virginia identified and then you got involved in working with the Senate to craft the bill to solve the problem? That's a great question. Um, from my involvement, <clears throat> the, the Opportunity Solutions Project, um, we partner with a, a think tank called the Foundation for Government and Accountability, and that organization looks at policy issues as states kind of say, we have a, we have a problem with issue X, then they start researching it, and they research it to death until they come up with what they consider a policy, a policy solution that makes sense to offer to a state to consider. Over the years, unemployment has been one of those problem areas that they've looked into, and in their research, this whole concept of indexing, the sliding scale of weeks, tackling fraud and abuse, um, work search activities that are more robust, those emerged as they started to look at states that are doing well with it, states that have stable systems with affordable um, rates for employers with a quicker return to work. So then they developed this policy idea, and we take it to legislators. They, so I took it um, to the legislative leadership in West Virginia, and President Blair was very interested in his top concern. Um, gosh, back in, in, in mid-2021 probably was, you know, I keep hearing about we have all these help-wanted signs, particularly on the part-time work side, but people are saying they would lose money if they went back to work part-time while looking for a full-time job because they're making more in unemployment than they would make um, working part-time because of that penalty, because their unemployment would get reduced. Mm -hmm. So that interest sparked the conversations with workforce. How can we put this all together to accomplish all the goals that we've seen work in other states, but then take this one step further? How do we remove this part-time work penalty? Because nobody should be penalized for saying, you know what, I've lost my full-time job, but I want to keep getting out there and, and remaining productive and remaining in the habit of reporting to work um, and still save them the time that they need to then look for the new full-time job. So it's been really just dynamic, organic conversations um, that, that have resulted in, in a piece of legislation that is, is very um, comprehensive, I guess is the right word. How much, or is this remaining to be figured out in the bill, can a person earn before it would affect their unemployment benefits? Um, say that again. You mean on the part-time side? Yeah, so if I'm drawing $400 a, um, a week in unemployment benefits or, or whatever the number is, uh, and I decide I want to also do a little part-time work because I can't get by on that, how much can I earn before that starts to reduce the unemployment benefit? I think you can earn up to, in workforce, gosh, if, if they're listen, listening, I hope I don't get this wrong, I think $60 once you earn, and if you're honest and report it. Now, a lot of people probably do work on the side and just don't report it. Um, but if you are honest and, and follow the rules and report that part-time income, I think you can make up to $60 a week that doesn't affect it but then once you do there is there is a calculation that i'm not even going to try to to figure out for you on the air um that then factors into how your your maximum weekly benefit would decrease and that, that's currently that is current what what would, would this would this the new bill would lift it to what do we know yet it would, it would be, you could make all the way up to your maximum weekly benefit so I if see. your maximum weekly nice. benefit was two hundred dollars a week then you could work part-time in in that part-time job make, make up to two hundred dollars per week so you'd be, you'd be doubling your weekly income and only working part-time so that you'd still have half of your time to complete the work search activities and find a new full-time job. Gotcha. 
I'm still stuck on the whole you don't have to take a job if you've got to commute a lot farther than you did before. I mean, I was well, always – I, I was taught, yeah. you know, if you, don't, if you don't have a job and you've got yourself and family to feed, you know, you dig ditches. You do whatever you have to do to take care of your family. I mean, as well, an, and a lot of people do. I don't. I, well, no, no, I'm sure a lot of people do. I'm saying, as an employer, just saying, there's, yeah, these are federal laws about what, wow. what is considered. Yeah, suitable. no, I didn't. I, I yeah. did not know. That's crazy. I mean, if it, there's if there's a yeah. job and you've got to inconvenience yourself by getting up a little earlier to go to it, that shouldn't. Um, I mean, that that shouldn't make it, the rest it, of society have to pay for you because. I mean, I, I'm self-employed. I work 60, 70 hours a week, sometimes more, to make sure my family's taken care of. I mean, I don't... But as a self-employed person, you're not paying into unemployment. Right, right. There's no there's no, um, there's no, no uh, parachute for me. Right. Um, so a couple other financial things on that. One of the reasons why we have to really take a look at this um, is because, as you guys mentioned during the pandemic, when the, the system was overloaded with claims... One thing the administration did at that time was allow people like you and me, sole proprietors, gig workers, cash economy folks, to file unemployment claims even though they'd never paid into the system. Um, that hit every single state's trust fund like a ton of bricks. So in West Virginia, we were able to use CARES Act money to, to repay a federal loan to keep our unemployment trust fund afloat and then refund our fund. Only in America can you use federal money to repay federal money, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, anyway, when our trust fund then, after that infusion, increased above 20, $220 million, that was a threshold set in code that triggered a 25% reduction in what employers pay. Sounds great, right? Okay, 25% reduction in the employer taxes. There's another section of code that that triggered that required a recalculation of the maximum, like, maximum weekly benefit. As of July 1 last year, the maximum weekly benefit for uh, claims went from $424 up to $630. And that's a 48% increase. I promise I did not do that math. Someone else did it for me. <laughs> that was um, if you did, that was quick. I like that. You've got a 20% reduction in what's going into the fund and a 48% increase in what's going out. So that is another reason we have to really take a look at this benefit term because that math does not work in the long term. That equals bankruptcy. Hey, uh, Julia, appreciate your time this morning. How can our audience find more about Opportunities Solutions Project and the effects on SB 59? Go to solutionsproject.com. You can also look at all of the research on vfga.org um, or just contact me. Good stuff. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Julia. Thanks, for the Thanks Julie.